Hezekiah Tunnel, discoveries that prove the Bible. A small fragment of a stone inscription was recently discovered in the Siloam Tunnel. The tunnel is situated in the Arab neighborhood of Silwan in Eastern Jerusalem, with a rich history dating back to ancient times. This tunnel is commonly referred to as Hezekiah's Tunnel because it is believed to have been constructed during the reign of King Hezekiah of Judah around the late 8th to early 7th century BC. In this video, we'll discuss Hezekiah's Tunnel, a discovery that proves the Bible. It's described in the Bible in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 20, and 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 30. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 20, the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might, and how he made the Siloam pool and the aqueduct and brought water into the city. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? While the tunnel is a historical and engineering marvel, it's connected to specific biblical events is proven. Here are some aspects of Hezekiah's tunnel and its connection to biblical history. Let's begin. In a groundbreaking development, five newly deciphered royal inscriptions of King Hezekiah of Judah, boasting dozens of lines and hundreds of letters, have emerged as one of the most significant archaeological discoveries. These inscriptions, now decoded, provide invaluable insights into Hezekiah's reign, particularly during his initial 17 years as king. The inscriptions mentioned Hezekiah's name and briefly outlined critical actions from this period. Among the notable events chronicled are the ambitious water project, encompassing the excavation of the Siloam Tunnel and the pool's construction. Additionally, the inscriptions shed light on Hezekiah's efforts in ritual reform, the successful conquest of Philistia, and the accumulation of property. It has been revealed that the water project, completed on the 2nd of Tammuz, during the 17th year of Hezekiah's reign, corresponds to 709 BC. This precise date adds to our understanding of Hezekiah's achievements. The ancient Siloam inscription, a pivotal piece of evidence validating the completion of Hezekiah's tunnel as described in the Bible, was uncovered in 1880 within the tunnel itself. This inscription was eventually transported to Istanbul by Ottoman rulers who governed the Holy Land during that period. This revelation reinforces existing evidence and sheds new light on Hezekiah's rule during the late 8th century BC. Abundant archaeological findings had already provided substantial evidence to support various aspects of the biblical narratives concerning Hezekiah, even before these recent inscriptions were discovered. However, the recent discoveries have provided even more detailed accounts of Hezekiah's military campaigns, religious reforms, and ambitious construction projects. These findings closely align with the statements made in the Bible, further validating the historical accuracy of the biblical account. The inscriptions offer an intricate glimpse into Hezekiah's military strategies, showcasing the vivid reality. Additionally, the inscriptions document Hezekiah's ambitious construction projects, offering a comprehensive view of the infrastructure developments that took place during his reign. In essence, the convergence of archaeological and epigraphic evidence strengthens the historic authenticity of Hezekiah's reign, substantiating the biblical accounts of his leadership, religious convictions, and significant contributions to the Kingdom of Judah during a pivotal period in ancient history. Shiloh's segment featured the word 17th, a crucial detail that when cross-referenced with additional inscriptions, confirmed it as the year of Hezekiah's reign when he orchestrated the construction of the tunnel and the pool. The inscription found mentions the 17th year of Hezekiah's reign, which is estimated to be around 709 BC, based on the beginning of his co-regency. This monument, which was previously a mystery, is now a testament to Hezekiah's presence in the 8th century BC and his significant contribution to the city's water management infrastructure during a crucial time in biblical history. The convergence of textual, archaeological, and epigraphic evidence strengthens the historical narrative surrounding Hezekiah's reign in Judah. Empty Tunnel Plaques This monument, which was previously a mystery, is now a testament to Hezekiah's presence in the 8th century BC and his significant contribution to the city's water management infrastructure during a crucial time in biblical history. 
For over a century, tourists have explored Hezekiah's tunnel without realizing that secret royal messages were concealed within it. However, they mention more of the king's activities. The Summary Inscription at the Canaanite Pool Detailed publications on these inscriptions are still to come. However, an English translation of the Canaanite Pool plaque has been provided. It fits well with the Bible's assertions concerning Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, made the pool and the conduit. In the seventeenth year, the king brought the water into the city by a tunnel, and the king led the water into the pool. He made the pool and the conduit and brought water into the city. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 20. He smote the Philistines from Ekron to Gaza. He struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory, from watchtower to fortified city. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 8. He broke the images and broke in pieces the Nehushtan, and he removed the high places and cut down the Asherah. He removed the high places, broke the pillars, and cut down the Asherah, and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4. Hezekiah, the king, accumulated in all his treasure houses and in the house of Yahweh a lot of silver and gold, perfumes, and good ointment. And Hezekiah welcomed them, and he showed them all his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his armory, all that was found in his storehouses. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 13. This summary inscription, Galil, continued, is arranged in literary order, not chronologically, and is divided into five components, title, the water project, the wars against Philistia, the reform, and the accumulation of property. Eli Shukran, a well-known archaeologist who dedicated more than 15 years to excavations in the city of David, played a crucial role in the discovery. Shukran challenged the assumption that the frames of the writings were just empty preliminary preparations and believed there were hidden messages within them. Collaborating with Professor Galil, they revisited and re-evaluated the frames, which led to the groundbreaking revelation of the inscriptions. According to Galil, the inscriptions discovered can be considered the earliest Bible manuscripts. These artifacts predate the Ketef Hanam, silver amulets, by around 100 years and the Dead Sea Scrolls by several centuries, making them historically significant. This finding supports the argument that the Book of Kings scriptures are based on passages from chronicles and royal inscriptions. It strengthens the idea that the Bible is a historical record, rather than just a legend of mythology. The Ketef Hanam scrolls, previously thought to be the oldest surviving Bible passages dating back to around 600 BC during the First Temple era, are now eclipsed by these newly uncovered inscriptions. The implications of his discovery are profound providing scholars with tangible evidence that enhances our understanding of biblical history and its early written records. These are the earliest manuscripts of the Bible. They predate the Ketef Hanam silver amulets by about 100 years and the Dead Sea Scrolls by hundreds of years. They also support the claim that scriptures in the Book of Kings are based on text from chronicles and royal inscriptions and that the Bible reflects historical reality, not imagination. Gershon Galil, a reliable record. These new findings provide strong evidence supporting the historical accounts in the Bible. The biblical account provides an accurate representation of historical events. Consistently, archaeology confirms the accuracy of Scripture. Who is Hezekiah? Hezekiah came to the throne of Judah at the very end of the kingdom of Israel. After three years of his reign, the Assyrian armies attacked Samaria and conquered the northern kingdom three years later. Hezekiah was a wise king who ruled over Judah for a long time and enjoyed a prosperous reign. He learned an important lesson from the downfall of the northern kingdom. He saw firsthand the consequences of people rejecting God and his teachings and instead worshiping other gods. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He removed the high places. Hezekiah was a zealous reformer of Judah prohibited worship on the high places. These altars were popular, but were not according to God's direction. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah. 
Hezekiah stood out with his fervent trust in God and dedication to promoting genuine worship. It's even more impressive considering his father Ahaz was one of Judah's worst kings. It is remarkable that such a man as Hezekiah could be the son of Ahaz, yet we must remember that all his life, he was under the influence of Isaiah. God blessed Hezekiah abundantly because he had unwavering trust in the Lord. This was a fulfillment of God's long-standing promise to David and his descendants, which stated that their reign would always be secure if they followed God's commands. Hezekiah was able to successfully subdue Judah's hostile neighbors and work towards establishing a powerful, autonomous, and free Judah. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. During this period, Assyria had enough power to completely conquer the northern kingdom of Israel. However, the kingdom of Judah remained resilient due to the blessings of a faithful and obedient king who trusted in God. 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 9 through 12. Now, in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, went up against Samaria and besieged it. At the end of three years, they captured it. In the sixth year of Hezekiah, which was the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Israel, Samaria was taken. Then the king of Assyria sent Israel into exile to Assyria and put them in Halal and on the harbor, the river of the city of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but broke his covenant, everything that Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded, and they would not listen nor do it. Both the people of the northern kingdom and the people of the southern kingdom were Israelites and descendants of Abraham by blood. There was no difference in their lineage. This revelation made it clear to Judah that if they stopped following and obeying God's commandments, they too would be subject to judgment. 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 13 through 16. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, went up against all the fortified cities of Judah, except Jerusalem, and captured them. Then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent word to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. So the king of Assyria imposed on Hezekiah, king of Judah, a tribute tax of 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house, temple of the Lord, and in the treasuries of the king's house, palace. At that time, Hezekiah cut away the gold framework from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorposts which he had overlaid, and gave it to the king of Assyria. It happened about five years after Samaria's downfall when the king of Assyria again attacked Judah, even though they had previously managed to resist him. He was able to capture all of the fortified cities in Judah, leaving only Jerusalem left for him to conquer in order to fully take control of the region. Hezekiah said, I have done wrong. Turn away from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will pay. Hezekiah lacked faith and believed it was safer to pay off the Assyrian king and become his subject rather than trusting God to defend Judah against the powerful king. Although his decision was understandable, it showed a clear lack of faith. It is possible that Hezekiah believed that since the northern kingdom had already been conquered and all the fortified cities of Judah had been captured, God would not intervene on their behalf. As a result, Hezekiah felt compelled to take action on his own. It is possible that Hezekiah's belief in Judah's deserving punishment was influenced by his father, Ahaz's wickedness and their past sins. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. Hezekiah believed that by appeasing, Judah would become safer. However, his policy resulted in the impoverishment of Judah in the temple and emboldened the king of Assyria to act more aggressively against Judah. 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 17 through 20. Then the king of Assyria sent to Tartan and the Rabsaris and the Rabshakeh, the highest officials with a large army, from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. They went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they went up and arrived, they stood by the aqueduct of the upper pool, which is on the road of the Fuller's Field. When they called for the king, Elakim the son of Helkiah, who was in charge of the king's household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asaph the secretary, went out to meet them. Then the Rabshakeh said to them, 
Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What is the reason for this confidence that you have? You say, but they are only empty words. I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom do you rely that you have rebelled against me? We read the term, the Rabshakeh. The term is actually a title instead of a name. It pertains to the field commander of the Assyrian army, who acted as a representative of King Sennacherib. The Rabshakeh appeared to have full control of the situation. He was able to enter Jerusalem and position himself at the city's vital water source, which was crucial during a siege. While he was there, three officials from Hezekiah's government approached him. We read, What confidence is this in which you trust? It would have been better if Hezekiah had trusted in the Lord, which was the very thing that the Rabshakeh ridiculed. However, Hezekiah chose to rely on an alliance with Egypt, and Rabshakeh attempted to undermine his confidence in that alliance. During this time, Hezekiah was tempted to form a defensive alliance with Egypt as they appeared to be the only nation capable of protecting Judah against the powerful Assyrians. As a prophet, Isaiah did everything he could to discourage Hezekiah and the leaders of Judah from putting their trust in Egypt. God wanted the people of Judah to put their trust in him rather than relying on Egypt. The Rabshakeh was truthful in stating that God didn't want Judah to rely on Egypt. However, the Rabshakeh didn't say it to instill trust in the Lord God, who has the power to save them from the Assyrians. Instead, he intended to dishearten and discourage Judah completely. Satan often attacks us in the same way. Often, even when he tells the truth, you are such a rotten sinner. He never does it to lead us to a firm trust in the Lord, our God. Jesus died for sinners, so I am a rotten sinner. Jesus died to forgive and free me. Instead, Satan's strategy, even if he tells us the truth, is always to demoralize us and drive us to despair. 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 21 through 25. Now pay attention. You are relying on Egypt, on that staff of crushed reed. If a man leans on it, it will only go into the hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust and rely on him? But if you tell me, we trust in and rely on the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed and is said to Judah in Jerusalem, you shall worship only before this altar in Jerusalem? Now then, make a bargain with my lord, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses, if on your part you can put riders on them. How then can you drive back even one official of the least of my master's servants, when you rely on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Now, have I come up against this place to destroy it without the lord's approval? The lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. We read, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt. Interestingly, the Rabshakeh had a better understanding of Egypt's vulnerabilities than many of the leaders of Judah. Hezekiah's reliance on Egypt could potentially create problems for Judah. 2 Kings chapter 18 verses 36 through 37. But the people kept silent and did not answer him, for the king had commanded, do not answer him. Then Elakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was in charge of the royal household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asap, the secretary, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn, in grief and despair, and told him what the Rabshakeh had said. We read, For the king's commandment was, Do not answer him. King Hezekiah issued a wise command, and both his officials and the people demonstrated wisdom by following it. We read, Came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn. Even though they didn't say anything, the episode still had a strong impact on them. They had the same experience Paul described in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 5. When King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes and he covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house temple of the Lord. Then he sent Eliakim, who was in charge of his household, Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet the son of Amos. They said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, 
This is a day of distress and anxiety, of punishment and humiliation, for children have come to the time of their birth, and there is no strength to rescue them. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to taunt and defy the living God, and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. So offer a prayer for the remnant of his people that is left in Judah, so the servant of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. When someone deeply mourned the loss of a loved one, they would often tear their clothes and wear a rough burlap-type material called sackcloth. Hezekiah took the report about Rabshakeh seriously because he knew that this enemy was determined to conquer Jerusalem completely. Hezekiah responded well to the situation and understood it for what it truly was. During times of hardship, it's common to struggle to accurately assess the situation. However, Hezekiah recognized that Jerusalem was in a dire state. 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 6 through 7. Isaiah said to them, Say this to your master, thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled, blasphemed me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he will hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. In this passage, it is said that the Lord God promised Hezekiah that he would take action against the Rabshakeh for his blasphemy. The Lord has heard his words and will bring judgment upon him. It's worth noting that the prophet Isaiah's first message did not mention anything about the liberation of Jerusalem or the downfall of the Assyrian military. Instead, God directed the message towards the Rabshakeh individually. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 8. So the Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna, a fortified city of Judah, for he had heard that the king had left Lachish. Hezekiah may have believed that the departure of the Rabshakeh from Jerusalem was the fulfillment of the Lord's promise through the prophet Isaiah. He might have felt relieved and thought that the Rabshakeh would go back to his own land and face the consequences as the Lord had promised. He may have been grateful to the Lord for this turn of events. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35. Then it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went forth and struck down 185,000 men in the camp of the Assyrians. When the survivors got up early in the morning, behold, all 185,000 of them were dead. We read, the angel of the Lord went out simply and powerfully. God destroyed this mighty army in one night. 185,000 died at the hand of the angel of the Lord. Despite all odds and expectations, the Assyrian army was unable to shoot a single arrow into Jerusalem and was ultimately defeated. This victory was unexpected but demonstrated the power of faith. We read, there were the corpses, all dead. God didn't find it difficult to dispatch an angel to do this task. However, it was a challenge for the Lord to get his people's hearts and minds in the right place. Once he accomplished this, sending an angel to do the work was a simple task for God. 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 36 through 37. So, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, left and returned home and lived at Nineveh. It came about as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that his sons Adremelech and Sherezer killed him with a sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat. And Ezar Haddon, his son, became king in his place. We witnessed their departure exactly as God had foretold. However, it was apparent that despite their leaving, they still retained their sense of pride. A popular Bible commentator noted, God spared Sennacherib, not in mercy, but in wrath, reserving to him a more dreadful and shameful death by the hands of his own children. We read, Now it came to pass, after a period of 20 years between 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 36, and 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 37, Sennacherib faced his fate. Despite thinking he had avoided God's judgment, he ultimately met his demise at the hands of his own son's swords. Thus Isaiah's prophecy of verse 7 was fulfilled. Hezekiah's passive victory over Sennacherib is another example of the Lord's promise to fight for his people. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 47, And that this entire assembly may know that the Lord does not save with the sword or with the spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will hand you over to us. 
The Lord acted as the defender of those who honored him and obeyed his commands. He sometimes allowed them to face challenges that were beyond their capabilities to showcase his power and love. The Lord still seeks those who will honor him so that he can show himself strong on their behalf. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth so that he may support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Therefore, from now on, you will have wars. The account of Sennacherib's failed siege ends with this. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others. He took care of them on every side. 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 22. Once more, the Lord has shown Judah and those who worship him that the battle belongs to the Lord. In the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah's reign, he fell ill. Hezekiah was sick unto death, which meant attacked by an ailment which, if it had run its natural course, would have been fatal. God sent Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, to deliver a message, and this dual designation of Isaiah, by his office and by his descent, makes the narrative's original independence. Isaiah chapter 38, verses 1 through 2. In those days, Hezekiah, king of Judah, became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said, For the Lord says this, Set your house in order and prepare a will, for you shall die, you will not live. And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall in response to Isaiah's announcement. Hezekiah prayed, Please, O Lord, just remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and truth, and with a whole heart, absolutely devoted to you, and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept greatly. Isaiah chapter 38, verse 3. Hezekiah was in his prime. He was only 39 years old. Hezekiah questioned himself. Did I deserve such a sentence? He was under the impression that he hadn't. He knew that despite his flaws, he had tried to serve God, had put his trust in him, had clung to him, had not strayed from following him, but had kept his commandments. 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 5-6 through 6. Hezekiah trusted in and relied confidently on the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. For he clung to the Lord. He did not turn away from faithfully following him. But he kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. As a result, he ventured on an earnest prayer, and God was pleased to hear and grant the prayer. Let us consider the unbiased testimony of 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 2. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Under the old dispensation, there was nothing to prevent men from pleading their righteousness before God. Psalm chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is injustice in my hands, if I have done evil to him who was at peace with me, or without cause robbed him who is my enemy, let the enemy pursue me and overtake me. Let him trample my life to the ground and lay my honor in the dust. Salah. Hezekiah didn't believe that he was sinless and he cried a lot. In the East, people expressed their emotions more openly. They showed joy by laughing and shouting, while they expressed sadness by crying and screaming. For instance, David cried for Jonathan, 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12, and also for Absalom, 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 1. And Nehemiah cried over Jerusalem's destruction, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. When Joash heard the words of the law, he too cried. 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 19. Because your heart was tender, receptive, penitent, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I said against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and because you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I have heard you, declares the Lord. But then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 38, verses 4 through 6. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, for the Lord, the God of David, your father, says this, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Listen carefully. I will add 15 years to your life. I will rescue you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend the city, Jerusalem. 
The Book of Kings depicts graphically how Isaiah had gone out after delivering his message, but had not reached the palace's middle court when his footsteps were stopped, and the divine voice commanded him to turn again and relieve Hezekiah's fears by a fresh announcement. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 4. That is, God responds quickly to the prayer of faith. According to the book of Kings, the full message sent to Hezekiah was, 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 5 through 6, Go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, ancestor, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears. Behold, I am healing you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord. I will add fifteen years to your life and save you in the city, Jerusalem, from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will protect this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. This was doubling, or more than doubling, the length of Hezekiah's reign and allowing him to live longer than the vast majority of Judah's kings, who rarely lived past the age of 50. Hezekiah lived to be 54 years old. It was the day of the free offering of signs by God to those whom his providence had placed at the head of his people. Isaiah chapter 38, verses 7 through 8. This shall be the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. Listen carefully. I will turn the shadow on the stairway, denoting the time of day, ten steps backward, the shadow on the stairway, sundial of Ahaz. And the sunlight went ten steps backward on the stairway where it had previously gone down. This healing brought great joy to Hezekiah because after recovering from his illness, Hezekiah appears to have retracted his feelings as he lay on his sickbed and embodied them in his monody. It has been well termed a peculiar sweet and plaintive specimen of Hebrew psalmody. Isaiah chapter 38 verses 9 through 20. This is the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after he had been sick and had recovered from his illness. I said, in midlife, I am to go through the gates of Sheol, the place of the dead. I am to be summoned, deprived of the remainder of my years. I said, I will not see the Lord, the Lord in the land of the living. I will no longer see man among the inhabitants of the world. My dwelling body is pulled up and removed from me like a shepherd's tent. I have rolled up my life as a weaver, rolls up the finished web. He cuts me free from the warp of the loom. From day to night, you bring me to an end. I lay down until morning, like a lion, so he breaks all my bones. From day until night, you bring me to an end. Like a swallow, like a crane, so I chirp. I coo like a dove. My eyes look wistfully upward. O Lord, I am oppressed. Take my side and be my security. What shall I say? For he has spoken to me, and he himself has done it. I will wander aimlessly all my years because of the bitterness of my soul. O Lord, by these things men live, and in all these is the life of my spirit. Restore me to health and let me live. Indeed, it was for my own well-being that I had such bitterness. But you have loved back my life from the pit of nothingness, destruction, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. For Sheol cannot praise or thank you. Death cannot praise you and rejoice in you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. It is the living who give praise and thanks to you as I do today. Father tells his sons about your faithfulness. The Lord is ready to save me. Therefore, we will pay my songs on stringed instruments all the days of our lives at the house of the Lord. In the first two, he is looking forward to death, and his strain is mournful. In the last two, he has received the promise of recovery and pours out his thankfulness. Isaiah chapter 38, verse 12. My dwelling body is pulled up and removed from me like a shepherd's tent. I have rolled up my life as a weaver rolls up the finished web. He cuts me free from the warp of the loom. From day to night, you bring me to an end. Hezekiah's prayer was answered, and he now has the result. He was at a loss for words to express his awe and gratitude. God had spoken to him and promised him recovery, and he had also kept this promise. Already, he senses the beginnings of change in himself. He is aware that the worst has passed and that the illness has improved. Isaiah chapter 38, verse 17. Indeed, it was for my own well-being that I had such bitterness. But you have loved back my life from the pit of nothingness, destruction. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. 
In verse 17, Hezekiah declares that the agony he endured was for the true peace and comfort of his soul. Despite his protests, Hezekiah maintains his integrity. He knew that he had sinned. He regarded his sins as having brought down upon him the sentence of death. However, soon after his recovery, Hezekiah made two critical errors. First, the Babylonians sent a gift to Hezekiah because they had heard he was sick. In his arrogant arrogance, Hezekiah displayed to the Babylonians all of his treasures, all of his silver and gold, and all of his arsenal. Nothing Hezekiah did was not paraded in front of them. Isaiah chastised Hezekiah for his actions and predicted that everything the king had shown the Babylonians would be taken to Babylon, along with Hezekiah's own descendants. Second, in the years following his illness, Hezekiah fathered the heir to Judah's throne, Manasseh, who would go on to become Judah's most evil king. Although it is not mentioned in the Bible, Tradition holds that Manasseh was the one who assassinated Hezekiah's friend, Isaiah. Hezekiah's life is a model of faithfulness and trust in the Lord for the most part. His faith was more than just a facade, as evidenced by his bold reforms. Hezekiah's faith in the Lord was rewarded with answered prayer, prosperous endeavors, and miraculous victory over his adversaries. When confronted with an impossible situation, surrounded by the dreadful and determined Assyrian army, Hezekiah did exactly what he should have done. He prayed, and God responded. However, a well-known pastor is quoted as saying that he believed Hezekiah lived too long because his son, who he had as a result of the extra years, became the worst king in the Bible. Yet another fascinating find. If you ever find yourself in Jerusalem, I recommend visiting Hezekiah's tunnel in your itinerary. Unlike many archaeological finds, which are often observed through the glass of a museum, this tunnel offers a unique and immersive experience akin to an entertainment park. While some travelers may prioritize something other than this historical marvel, those who choose to embark on the journey are in for a truly captivating experience. Descending the steep slope from the Temple Mount, you enter Hezekiah's Tunnel, a testament to an incredible technical achievement during a pivotal period in Jerusalem's history. The tunnel would still be noteworthy if it were only 10 feet long and 5 feet deep. However, the sheer majesty of Hezekiah's tunnel elevates it to the forefront of archaeological significance. The scarcity of notable artifacts from the 8th century BC further emphasizes the importance of engaging with this historical marvel. As you navigate through the tunnel, the cool spring water underfoot may present challenges, and some sections may be uncomfortable for those who are claustrophobic. Yet reflecting on what was at stake for the tunnel construction workers is crucial. Their dedication stemmed from a profound belief in God, coupled with the awareness that the success of their endeavor had profound implications for the safety and well-being of their loved ones. Hezekiah's tunnel provides a tangible connection to the past, allowing visitors to step into the days of Hezekiah and marvel at the individuals who undertook this monumental task with unwavering faith and tireless effort. The significance of Hezekiah's tunnel extends beyond its archaeological importance. It symbolizes human ingenuity and devotion in the face of challenges. Hezekiah's tunnel stands out as a top 10 revelation in the grand tapestry of archaeological discoveries. Its rarity and the immersive experience it offers make it a compelling destination for those interested in history, theology, and the profound impact of faith on monumental human achievements. That's all the information. Let me summarize everything once again for you. However, this is not the only evidence that proves the Bible. To watch another discovery that proves the Bible, click here.